Well, welcome to Dayspring Chicago Bible Study. Dayspring Commission Bible Study 6 3 24. Imagine, half a year has already passed. Wow, wow, we. My goodness. <laughs> well, let's get into the word. Let's get into prayer. And let's just see what God's going to do today as He takes us on this journey concerning the power of the imagination. And uh, we're going to learn some things I believe that God wants us to understand about this. Father, today we bless you. We thank you so much. It's a beautiful day. It's the day that you have made. Therefore, we can rejoice and be glad in it. Are there things happening all around us? Yes. Are there things taking place even in believers' lives? You said it would. You said that, Lord, there's no testing or trial that has befallen you that is not common to man. Some of those trials will never fall, fall upon us. Others we will see, but we can triumph over them. All because you have already made provision for us, Lord. And we can do all things through Christ. And your word also tells us that you will deliver us. A righteous man may fall seven times, but will rise again. So we thank you, Lord, that whatever our brethren are going through, there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, as they say. There's hope that will bring us out. And there's a promise to meet every and face every situation and come out victorious. We bless you and thank you, Lord, that you have not left us alone. You sent us your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Therefore, we look to you today, Lord, to help us as we get into your word, to open up our understanding and our hearts, that we might receive that which you want to impart to us today, that we might learn, understand, and execute the truths that come into our hearts by way of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All righty. Well, let's get continue on. We missed last week. Of course, uh, uh, those here in, in, in the United States were celebrating uh, Memorial Day. And so we thank God for those that have served and those that have paid the price for our freedom. And around the world, different others have their days to celebrate. But we thank God that we have one memorial that we will never forget. That's why we have Holy Communion, remembering our Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price. Amen. And thank God for all those that have paid the price as well, preaching the gospel as well. So we honor them and we praise God for their lives. Well, we're looking at the scripture that we launched with our statement and our, and our, our subject on do you see what I see? In John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said the son can do nothing of himself. What he sees the father do, that's what he does. And so we launched from there to begin to understand and learn something about part of the culture of the kingdom and how it operates. And part of that is learning how to come into a place where we begin to operate like Jesus did. Because remember, Jesus is the pattern. Okay, okay, yes, even the lion in the back is shaking his head. I said Jesus is the pattern. He's the pattern for all believers. So therefore, it would behoove every one of you to go ahead and start learning and observing and watching and, and following the master because he's the one who is the pattern for each and every believer in this life. So Jesus went and he, and he didn't do anything unless he went and heard from the Father and he went into a place we call the secret place. Now, having said all that, you can go back and go back for, to the beginning of the year, even before that, and you can go ahead and start developing this message if you really want to learn about do you see what I see. I want us to go and I said to you, I'm going to give you some scriptures. We're going to launch out of, uh, out of Corinthians. But before we do that, let me give you an intro uh, to, this, to this subject here on the imagination. Proverbs 20, verse 12. So if you're taking notes, here we go. And of course, remember, all this is posted later on on YouTube as well as on Facebook, Face, uh, uh, Dayspring Commission. You can go there on YouTube, on Facebook, um, and of course on uh uh, Marisa Ligon on YouTube and of course uh, Brother Sal is going to be putting on his own on YouTube soon so you can just go there as well. Alrighty, Proverbs 20 verse 12. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, this is King James now, the seeing ear uh, uh, amplified, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them, King James. In other words, God is the one who has what? Has made the hearing ear and the seeing eye. God made them both. And both will affect, listen, both will affect the what? The imagination. Always remember that. We call it in theological terms, circles, they say the eye gate and the ear gate will affect 
the heart, the belief system. So you have here in Proverbs, now you would say, well, you know, every person is born with eyes and ears. Uh, yes, but there are some that are born blind. There are some that are born deaf. So here we are talking about something more. We're talking about spiritual things. Here we're talking about a spiritual ear. Remember that Jesus, when he spoke to us in parables, he always ended with this, he that had an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Hmm? And so we learned that, that there is a natural ear to hear and there is a spiritual ear to hear. Likewise, there is a natural eye to see and there is a spiritual eye to see. That's why when you begin to start drifting away in a daydream, your eyes are open, but you're, you're seeing something. Have you ever noticed that people that daydream don't daydream with their eyes closed? They daydream with their eyes open. Sometimes you have to shake them and say, hey, hey, what, what, are, you, what are you thinking about? What are you? They drifted off into a light form of a vision, an open eye vision. Well, now what they were seeing was they were seeing something with what people would call in the, in the, in the uh, occultist world, the third eye. Now they'll call it the third eye, but the Bible calls it the imagination. Now God created the imagination. He gave it to man with a purpose because it allows you to be able to connect in the spirit, to be able to see things in the spirit realm. It is that dimension, it is that connection called the, 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 the imagination that allows you to see things from a different dimension. Remember that we talked about the first dimension, you know, we talk about the second dimension, the third dimension, and finally the fourth dimension. Uh, you, know, uh, for, you know, when you talk about the first dimension, you talk about a line, you draw a line on a piece of paper, that's the first dimension, that's, that's one dimensional. Uh, if you make it a circle, you, uh, you make the line, you connect it into a circle, now that's two dimensional. It's still flat, but it's two dimensional. And then you have what we call the third dimension. The third dimension is the dimension you and I live in. Right now, right now, uh, Milan is in her, is in, I can see Milan is in her, in her room. I see there's a picture above her. Uh, it, it, she lives in a three-dimensional world. She, uh, I, I can see something pink behind her head. She's wearing glasses. All these things are three-dimensional. Uh, you can feel them. You can touch them. And so, and so we, we live in a third-dimensional world. Now, the second dimension is, is what, what we, it still can only be expressed on what we call paper, all right? But actually the second dimension, listen now, the second dimension is, is, actually, is actually created in the imagination. And that's why in the imagination, you see it, and then you begin to either sketch it, write it down, or whatever, and you give it on a second dimension level. You begin to sketch it out. Let's say, let's say uh, um, a table, a chair. You see it in your mind, so you begin to sketch it out. You begin to put it down its dimensions. You begin to, and then what happens? After that, you take it from the second dimension, and then you take it, and you begin to find wood, you begin to start forming it in, a, in the shapes that you want, and eventually what was on the second dimension, a piece of paper, begins to start, start taking form in the third dimension. Do you understand what I'm saying? So now you have created a chair, but it originated on a piece of paper as a design. But actually, it was first created in your imagination. Somebody saw it somewhere. Architects, they may draw the architectural rendering, but they saw that somewhere. They saw that here in their, in their imagination. 
they began to perceive it. They began to see it. And once they began to see it, because they were taught a certain discipline, they were able to then take the discipline, put it on paper, and then it was translated, whether through CAD or any other computer device or whatever, and eventually began to take on form. They began to, to, to translate it into various products and form the products. And whether it was steel, whether it was concrete, whatever it was, they began to form the shape of what was in that in that architectural rendering until you finally have the end product the building but it started here in the in the imagination so the imagination pulls out of listen now the imagination pulls out of the fourth dimension realities and then once it pulls them out of the fourth dimension and begins to meditate on them. Listen to me. Meditation is not a bad word. Meditation should never be limited to Eastern meditation. Om, Om. No, 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 no. Remember, write it down somewhere. Joshua 1.8. You remember Joshua 1.8? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. So now watch. You have the book of the, of the commandments of God. And it's not supposed to, it's not supposed to be forgotten. You're supposed to what? Have it before you. And as you read it, you should be muttering it. You should be repeating it under a low breath. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Hmm? But you shall meditate upon it day and night, that you may do what is written therein. And when you do these things, then you shall have good success. So what it's saying to you is this. The word that's used there, uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate. The word meditate there is the word that's used for a cow who chews the cud. For those of you that don't know what a cow, what a, how a cow goes through the process of producing white milk from green grass, is early in the morning, the cows go out early in the morning. They'll go out to graze. And they'll graze until about 11 o'clock. And when the sun comes out and it begins to start getting hot, the cows have enough brains to get out of the sun. And they go and find some tree or some shade and they will sit there. And they will, all, the, all of that grass that they ate, they stored it in different pouches in their stomach. And they begin to regurgitate that. And they begin to chew on it. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Taking all the good stuff out of it. And then, mmm. And then they'll throw that into another pouch in their stomach. And they'll get up some more of that good stuff and keep chewing. And it goes through how many pouches? I think it's four pouches. Goats do the same thing. Sheep do. They just keep going through that process until after a while it comes out the back end. And be careful where you step because that's it all right then you get the milk and then you get all the all that so what is it what is the cow doing it is what mm, meditating it is chewing the cud it's going over and over until it gets everything out of that out of that grass that it chew, it stored and it chewed got it so 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 Joshua says, this book of the law, God's word should not depart out of your mouth. In other words, you want to really get the word of God in your heart so that you really memorize it. You should not only read it, but while you read it, you should say it. Because it's two forms of getting it into your heart. One way is to see it. The other way is to say it. You know, it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to hear it and read it. Then it's another thing to hear it, read it, and say it. Then it really sticks with you. How come some, some of you can, if I ask you right now, what's your social security number? Bam, you could just quote it to me right now. 
You don't have to go and look for your social security card. I mean, if you ask me what's my social security number, boom, I got it right now. I know what it is. What's your phone number? I can tell you. What's my wife's phone number? Honey, what's your phone number? <laughs> Hello? I don't repeat it often. I don't use it often. All I say is cositas. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> huh? All I'm saying to you is something that you continually practice. You know, the, the Doobie Brothers, back in the 70s, they had an album called What Were Once Vices Are Now Habits. <laughs> so the more you keep doing something, it becomes a habit. Huh? And so therefore, what, is what does it say in Joshua? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. It's not departing out of your mouth because you have now put it in your heart through the eye gate and you're repeating it and you're also hearing it while you're saying it. And then it says it, you're going to meditate on it. So while you're going out throughout your day, that word will come up again. That word will come up again and you'll think about it and you'll meditate on it. And here's the thing about meditating on something. When it comes to things of the spirit, the more you meditate on it, the more you begin to get more out of it. Just like the cow. Mm, 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 it gets more nutrients, throws it back down, pulls it up again, mm, gets more out of it. Mm, I thought I had ended. You know, it's like a piece of bubble gum. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, you take it out, you put it, you know, you put it on the side. Then you come back, pick it up. Mm, I still has flavor in there. I, I don't know about you. I grew up in the ghetto, so I know about bubble gum. I, I, it still had flavor. Mm, mm, mm. I, went extra, I went an extra mile with it. All I'm saying to you is you thought, you, okay, never mind. I'm just saying to you, you're, chew, you're extracting more from it. All right, now listen, this is, how, this is how the imagination works. This is how the word works. You take in the word, you meditate on it. The Holy Spirit gives you a revelation. Say revelation. All right, now you've got a revelation. But you see, the thing about God is, is God's word is like a diamond. You'll see one facet of the revelation of the diamond. Ooh, look at that beautiful light that came out of it. But then when you go and look at it again, and it just moves just a little, you see another facet. Oh, I didn't see that color. Oh, look at that one. And then you move it again. Wow, look at that. Oh, I didn't see that. Hello? And so we call it a multifacet gem because there's multi sides to it and so the word of god is that way as you meditate on it guess what you get another glimpse another level of revelation and the more you glimpse and the more you meditate on it the deeper the revelations keep flowing hello now we talked to you and told you uh, i think it was last week or the week before when we talked to you that there were two types of light in the world, you remember that? We talked to you about two lights in the world. We said to you that there is the light that comes from the Lord. I am the light of the world. So the, the, there is illumination, two types of illumination. One illumination comes from God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, these are not in my notes, I'm giving you this. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, it says that Jesus is the one who lights every man that comes into the world. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Uh, all right, and then it goes on, it says that he is, he is the one that lights every man that comes into the world. Isn't that interesting? So God, the Lord is the one. God lights every man that comes into the world. He gives them a spark of consciousness. Everybody is born with a consciousness, a conscience, consciousness, a conscience. Everybody has a conscience. But you're not accountable 
until you reach the stage of a conscious of a consciousness or accountability. We call some say 11, some 12 years old. You know, Jews have their bar mitzvah. The kid turns 12 or 13. You know, uh, uh, you have your you, you have your the uh, quinceañeras. You have your Whatever, little kids turn 12 years old, you celebrate. They're now changing from 12 to 13. Now they're teenagers. In other words, it's rite of passage, whatever. But the age of accountability differs according to the child's state of understanding, right? Okay, so, so at that point now, they're accountable for what they do because they're no longer a little kid. No, you know better. Yeah. Their conscience now comes into, a pl for, into play. So, so... Here we have that the Lord illuminates everyone that comes into this world. We said to you that God is the source of light. James chapter 1. It says, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. The Father of what? Of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. In other scriptures, it says God is light. There is no darkness with him. And so then we, we are establishing there's two, two lights. There's the light of God. So the light that flows from God or illumination that flows from God or revelation, Milan, that flows from God is what kind of light? Clean, pure. Philippians, come on somebody. Uh, Sirius is not with us right now. But you will find in Philippians that it says, it says, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are, are good, if there's any virtue in them, if they're, if, they're, if they're pure, if they're good, if they're virtuous, think, dwell, meditate on these things, Paul wrote. So you find then that whatever things that come from God are pure, clean, righteous, virtuous. Now, there's another source of light in the world. It's called illumination, but it's not the same. This illumination is dark in its source. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 6, you know the story where Jesus says, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust do decay, but ra rather lay up treasures in heaven where it can't be destroyed or thieves cannot break in and rob. Is that correct? Okay, so I'm ad-libbing, but you know, you know the scriptures there. All righty, then he goes on and says this. He says, the light of the body is the eye. In other words, the source of illumination for the soul comes through the eye. The light of the body is the eye. If the eye is good, if the eye is good, then the whole body will be filled with light. But if the eye is not good, then the whole body will be filled with darkness. And how great is that darkness? Now, I'm going to go and read it for you real quick because I don't want to be... Um, I don't want to misquote it for you. It's Matthew. And somebody said, Amen. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, if I was racing with the, with the Baptist here to find in our Bible, <laughs> I remember we used to have races with the Baptist. We'd invite them and we'd have races. Who can find the scripture first? <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 6. What does it say? Matthew chapter 6. And he says this in verse twenty. Two, the lamp of the body is the eye, the source of illumination. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, if it is healthy and clear, if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. In other words, you're gonna you're gonna carry out you're gonna carry out acts of righteousness. You're gonna do what's right, because remember the body is just a slave. The body only does what the soul dictates to it to do through its will. Do we all agree? Amen, Manang Elsie. Amen. All right. No, so look at, look at what he says in the next verse, verse 23. But if your eye is 
bad, that is evil or unhealthy. In other words, it has a bad source of illumination. But if your, if your eye is bad uh, or evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So we learn that there's two types of light. There is good light, and then there is what kind of light? Bad light. Here he said, if the light that is in you is darkness. In other words, there is, there is a light or illumination that comes from darkness. It comes from the father of darkness or lies. So you have to remember there's the father of lights, and then there is the father of darkness. The father of darkness is Satan. And the darkness that he, he propagates is lies. Remember, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. So his DNA is already lying. It, he cannot tell the truth. You say, oh, but he quoted the Bible. Yes, but he quoted the Bible with ulterior motive. Hello? He never has a, a, a proper motive. Everything he does has an ulterior motive to kill, steal, and destroy, to get you off the path. If he can get a half-truth in and, help you, and let you believe it, get you to believe it, in order to get you off the path of truth, then he's already won because he's deceived you with a half-truth. So you have to remember there's two types of light. There's the light that comes from God. There's the, there's the light that's called light, but it's full of darkness. The source is darkness, and it's set to kill, steal, and destroy. It's set to get you off the path of life. So Satan is a deceiver. He's a liar and the father of lies. Now, having said that, after a while I'm meditating on that, you know what the Lord showed me, my lad? He said, oh, you forgot there's three lights in the world. There's not just the light of God, Jesus Christ. He said, and there's just not the dark light of Satan. He said, the third light is you. You are the light of the world also. Didn't he say that? So we are carriers of the light. You can write it down. I am a carrier of the glory. Say amen. All righty. So the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. So are you supposed to be hearing? Yes. So let's establish this truth here as we continue our study. Number one, God has created you to hear spirits. Hmm? Yeah. God created you to hear spirit voices. E, e is right. I just came from the house of someone we went to pray for yesterday. I believe I told you the story that we went over there a couple of weeks ago and prayed for her. And she said, she said, oh, you know, I was here in my room and I heard, I heard this growl. She said, I heard it twice. I said, oh, yeah, that's just the devil. That's just a demon because she's battling, she was battling cancer. I said, yeah. She said, I heard it. Twice. I said, well, that's just a demon. Yeah. And you know why it's growling? She said, no, but I've heard it twice. I said, it's growling because it can't touch you. You know why? Because he's, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear him. That angel's growling because it can't touch you. It's growling at that angel that's there protecting you. Well, we went there to pray for her Sunday. And she said, I heard the growl, except now it's like a little puppy. Hello, I'm telling you, <laughs> that thing is getting weaker. I said, you keep meditating on the word of God. You keep reminding yourself you're a child of the king. You keep reminding yourself what the psalmist said, I shall not die but live. You keep reminding you I'm the head and not the tail. Come on, somebody. And when you continue to do, focus and meditate on that, guess what? That voice gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it has to go. Hallelujah. Mm. So God developed the ability for you to hear the voice of spirits. 
I'm not going to get into that now. I'll talk about the three voices that you can hear, the three spirit voices that you should be hearing, all right, later on. But here we are. He gave you the ability to hear, and he also said what? The hearing ear and the seeing eye, God has made them both. So the seeing eye is which one? Not this eye, it's the imagination. He gave you this third eye that they call the third eye, but it's the imagination. I was listening to a major prophet and he was talking about how that he was ministering to someone. He said, and I was, I was, I was looking and, in, and with, my, with my third eye or imagination, he mentioned third eye or imagination. I could, I saw, I saw, I see you like this, and I see you oppressed, and I see you fight, battling this, and I see, yes, that's right, and, and 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 so and so he he began to tell her what he was seeing in the spirit, in in the imagination, because you can see in real time. Somebody write it down. You can see the past, you can see the 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 present, and you can see the future with your imagination because God uses that part of you to show you things. Now remember that Jesus said this about, about seeing into the future or seeing into the spirit world. Jesus said, when, when the comforter, the Holy Spirit comes, I'm going to leave, but I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you alone. I will send another one just like me. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He will lead you and guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. So the Holy Spirit will show you the future. Well, if he can show you the future, can he show you the past? Can he show you the present? He can show you past, present, future, because God is not bound by time. God is not limited to time. He lives in eternity. That's why the Bible says, I am the God that tells you the, the end in the beginning. I'll tell you how it's going to end before you even get there. Because I don't, I'm not bound by time like you in the third dimension. I live in the fourth dimension. I created everything, everything, and I know it all from A to Z and Z to A. Amen? That's why you should take comfort when it comes to trials and tests in your life. I was talking to, uh, to Felicitas about this uh, uh, yesterday, that we, you know, you got to take comfort in knowing this, that no matter what trial you're going through, you should understand that God was already in the in, was already in the in the future, in the past. He already dealt with it. To you, it's in the present. I'm going through this, but in the future, He already fixed it for you. Where in the past? So so your what you consider the future, he, he, that he's going to bring you through, he already took care of it in the past. That's why he, the Bible says, and after he was done, he rested. He's not going to get up for you, Milan, and fix your problem because he already fixed your problem. What you have to do is take his promises and, and know that what he said he will do, he's, he will do and that he has done it. And therefore, if he said you will come out victorious, then all you have to do is rest in the Lord and trust him that you will come out victorious. That you don't have to be biting your, your teeth and, 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 and staying up sleepless nights. That you know the God who formed you in your mother's womb, who knew you by name, who created Created you and knew you before you ever existed, who planned your life, uh, Jeremiah 29 11. He already knows all those things. Therefore, because he knew them ahead of time, he already planned out your victory ahead of time. What he wants from you is to have faith that what he said he has done for you is a done deal. Therefore, stop fidgeting, start trusting, start praising. And don't look at the bigness of your problem. Look at the bigness of your God. Because he gave you the seeing eye. And he gave you the hearing ear. So you develop the ability to, to discern the voice of God through the word of God. This is where you learn to discern the voice of God. 
if you had, if, 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 your, if your husband, if you had never met him except you co by correspondence, you only, you only had one, one encounter, and from that moment on, after that encounter, for 10 years, all you did was correspond by letter. But his letters were unique. They were, they were poetic and full of prose and, and, and flowery and, and oh. Huh? And you only saw him once and that was it. Ten years later, huh, some guy shows up and says, I'm, I'm so and so. Well, now people change in ten years. And this guy shows up. He says, I'm so and so. And he starts talking like, uh, and starts talking to you and, and the words that come out of his mouth don't match the letters that he sent you. The words on those letters, you're gonna go like, uh, I don't think so, hello. Because what's coming out of his mouth doesn't what? Doesn't match up with the way he was communicating on that letter. But when the real guy comes along, come on now, and begins to start talking to you, just a few phrases from him, lets you know, this is my sweetie, this is, this, this is my man. I, I can tell, how can you tell? You haven't seen him for 10 years, or you, you haven't heard, but I know his language. I know his, I, don't, I, I didn't have to hear his voice. I just know by the words he's speaking, they match up right here. Come on, somebody. And you begin to start now recognizing his voice because you recognize his voice here first. You heard his voice through his letters. And once you got a, 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 acquainted with his letter, with his letter, the voice of his letters, now when his voice comes to you live, you can go ahead and put it together and say, this is him. Same thing with God. You begin to start here discerning his voice here later on you can discern his voice when it comes to you in a still small voice when it comes to you in the middle of the night when it comes to you when you're just worshiping him waiting on him and loving on him because god made you to hear spirit voices now once you have developed chewing the cud when the voice of darkness comes to tell you something opposite of what the truth is, then you can say, no, no, that doesn't line up with what I have read in the word. I have digested the truth and that doesn't line up with the truth. The truth doesn't say I shall die. The truth says I shall live. The truth doesn't say my family's going to hell. The truth says I and my household shall be saved. The truth, come on somebody. You, you begin to discern that voice that says the negative and you say, no, that's contrary to what I know is truth. You see, because you've developed now the standard by which you can go ahead and measure what is truth and what is not. Because the Buddhists will tell you we have the truth. Muslims will tell you they have the truth. Shinto will tell you they have the truth. Mormons tell you we have the truth. But you will not be able to discern their lie if you haven't developed the standard of truth. That's why the, pro the problem with the current church right now is many are being deceived. And now they are questioning their faith because they have not taken time to develop a foundation of truth. And when they come with other forms of to make them question they begin to start, well, maybe, maybe you're right. You know, I'm having a crisis of faith right now. I'm questioning whether what I believed is really the truth. I'm going to explore other religions. Hello? And there's a falling away because people have not been taught the word and how to develop a standard of truth. The hearing ear and the seeing eye. The Lord has made them both, but you must develop them. Say amen, somebody. If I close right now, this would be pretty good. I said, if I close right now, this would be pretty good for part one, because these are things you need to understand. Why? Because this is part of the culture of the kingdom of God. 
And so as we go into this understanding about Elijah, what you see you be, you have to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. You have to see what God is saying. And that's why it's imperative that you find that secret place, that you develop the ability to perceive the voice of God and to recognize the words of God so that you're not caught up with the enemy's lies. Remember that in, Philippi, uh, that in the book of Ephesians, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, he talks to us there, and he says to us, Hey, Ephesians chapter 4, remember, Gentiles eat pork chops too. Gentiles, Galatians, eat Ephesians, pork, Philippians, chops, Colossians, 2, Thessalonians. I'm just acronym, you know. Gentiles eat pork chops too. So you know that Gentiles, Gen Galatians, eat Ephesians. So you know that if you're in Galatians, go one more book and that's Ephesians. All right? All right? I'm just giving you something. Gentiles eat pork chops too. You know, every good boy does fine. Guitar, you know, music. Okay. All right. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Ephesians chapter 4. You remember what he said there? He said this. He said that he gave gifts to men. Chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, uh, verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So that you hear that? So what is imperative? The fivefold ministry is supposed to help us to grow up spiritually so that we are able to be mature enough to not be thrown around by every wind of doctrine that comes down the pike, by everybody telling us this is the truth, that is the truth. No, we should be founded in the truth. We should know the doctrines of the church of Jesus Christ, and we should walk in those truths. Amen? And then we will not be tossed around. All righty. Having said all that, now let's go ahead and go to 1 Kings and, and lay a little foundation because we're going to talk about three uh, major individuals. Number one, we're going to talk about uh, King. 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. We're going to talk about a king named Ahab. We're going to talk about his wife named Jezebel, 1 Kings 16, 29 through 34. Ahab, we're going to talk about a woman, his wife named Jezebel. We're going to then conclude by talking about a prophet named Elijah. Don't confuse him with Elisha. Elijah with a J. So in 1 Kings 16, 29, let's start off here because it's laying, it's laying a history now of this king. In the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began his reign of 22 years over Israel in Samaria. Okay, so now we're mentioning two kingdoms. The kingdom was divided here. The kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. The kingdom of Judah, which was, which was run by Asa, and the other kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, which, was, which had its king over them named Ahab. All right, the kingdom was divided, if you recall, after Solomon's fall and all that. Okay? So you have what they call the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Don't confuse the, 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 the kingdom that's called Israel, which is the one that Ahab rules over. Okay? Don't confuse it as the whole kingdom of Israel. No, remember, they've been, they've been split. They were split. And so King Asa 
is the king of Judah. So he's the king over what? The northern kingdom. How do, how do I remember that? J is before I. H, I. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I is before J. So I is the northern kingdom. J is the southern kingdom. So Israel was, was split into two kingdoms, and one is called Judah. The other one is called Israel. I, J. So I is the northern kingdom. Because you'll read sometimes the king of the north, or the king of the south, and that all, then you'll know who's who in the zoo. The king of the north is who? The kingdom of Israel. And Judah is the king down in the, in the south. All right. Having said that, we now, we now understand that he became king and he ruled 22 years. Who? King Ahab. All righty. Now, Ahab, the son of Omri, verse 30, he did evil in the sight of the Lord above all those kings before him. Verse 31, as if it had not been a like thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, he also did this. He took for himself a wife, Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal. All right. King of the Sidonians. I'd underline that. And served Baal and worshipped him. So not only did he take a daughter of a heathen king, but he also took the gods of that king and worship that God called Baal. Verse 32, to add insult to injury, he erected an altar of Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Verse 33, Ahab, Ahab made an Asherah. An Asherah is an idolatrous symbol. I'm reading from the Amplified is an idolatrous symbol of the goddess Asherah. We could talk about her some other time. So he made an idol, an idolatrous symbol of the goddess Asherah as well. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel before him. Oof. I'm giving you a history about this King Ahab now. But remember, he took a heathen wife. And we'll uh, look at her history a little later. In, the, in his days, Hiel, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of the life of Abiram, Abiram his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub. Segub. <laughs> according, I'm thinking of Hubgrub. Segub. Uh, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Joshua, the son of Nun. If you need a reference to that, the Amplified tells you it's Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Anyway, we're just giving you that as a sidebar. So we find out that this King Ahab was a bad king. He had some bad issues with God. All righty? All righty. Now, that being the foundation now, this is, this, is the, this is the environment, the culture, and the times that a guy named Elijah is living in. So let's go to 1 Kings 17 and lay the foundation, and let's close with this tonight. 1 Kings 17, 1 through 9. Our introduction to Elijah. In the Amplified Bible, 1 Kings 17, verses 1 through 9, Elijah the Tishbite. Now, many don't know where this Tishbite place is. Uh, Gilead, we know, but nothing much is known about uh, 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 the Tishbites. And but Elijah the Tishbite of the of the temporary residents of Gilead said to Ahab. So he comes out of nowhere. He's a he comes to prophesy to this king, this wicked king, and says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand. If you have your pens, underline that. 
As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, underline it, highlight it, Xerox it, take a picture of it. Before whom I stand, there shall not be any dew or rain these years, but according to my word. So here is a prophet. He comes from an obscure place. The thing about prophets in those days was, if you were a prophet, you had to go to prophet school to be recognized. Today, if you want to be recognized as a minister, you're supposed to go to a cemetery. I mean, a, a, a seminary <laughs> and, uh, or a Bible college or, or something like that. All right. In other words, they wouldn't recognize you unless you went to the school of the prophets. That's what they called it back then. And so Elijah was not the product of the school of the prophets or anything like that. He was homegrown. He, he was developed, like, write it down, like John the Baptist in the secret place, in the wilderness. He was one of those hidden prophets. Woo, almost sounds like Jesus, who was also hidden until the day of his coming. Remember, Jesus was also called a prophet. Yes or no? Uh-huh. Moses prophesied about him and said, a prophet like me shall God send in the last days. So Jesus, remember he has three offices? Prophet, king, pre priest, and king. Prophet when he was on earth. King or, or priest, Right now, he sits at the right hand of the Father in the order of Melchizedek. He makes intercession for you and I. When he returns, he will be king on earth for a thousand years. And after that, he will continue to reign king and king forever and ever. Okay, so, he, so there are three obscure prophets that we know of. Well, where are they? Well, we could even include Moses in there, couldn't we? Moses for 40 years on the backside desert, and then he appears. So Elijah here is a prophet who is, who, is, who is nurtured, formed, and transformed by God in the secret place. Why do you think the devil fights you, my friend, from the secret place? Why do you think he fights you from spending time in the secret place? You know why? Because that's the place of formulating you, of developing you, of bringing you into the place of making you who he wants you to be for your generation, for your family, for your sphere of influence. He fights you. Isn't it the most difficult time you find is to spend time with the Lord? Okay, I'm talking to somebody out there. So Elijah was hidden, but when he comes out, he gives the secret to his power. He gives the secret to his anointing. As the Lord lives before whom I stand. Now I taught you this before, I believe it was Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Pure heart has to do with, come on, motives. It has to do with motives. Holiness, godliness. A person that has chewed the cud, that has allowed the word to transform them and make them in the image of God. Remember the original plan of God? Let us make man in our image and our likeness. The image of holiness, the likeness of his character. That's why the fruit of the Spirit reflects the character of God. Did you hear what I said? The fruit of the Spirit reflects the likeness of God. But the image of God is 
holiness. And holiness is developed by the fear of the Lord. I said holiness is developed by the fear of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It says to you, let us, having received such precious promises, let us go on to maturity or perfection. Let us go on. Uh, not, getting rid of all of the works of the flesh, all of those things that contaminate the flesh and the spirit, and perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. Because that's what? Let us make man in our image. God is restoring the image of holiness, of godliness, of righteousness. Righteousness was imputed to us in Christ the day we were born again. But how many know we have positional righteousness when we're born again, but progressive righteousness is, is something that we develop through our walk, through our actions, through our everyday life. Every act of obedience is an act of righteousness. Thank you, Lamb of God. I said every act of obedience is an act of righteousness because every act of righteousness is an act of obedience. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I commanded you to do? You don't find favor with me unless you're doing what I told you to do. So you're not righteous in my eyes unless you're doing what I told you to do. So every act of obedience is an act of righteousness. Can we say amen, somebody, before I lose you out there? Do you comprehend this? You have to understand this. So we are in the process of, be of being restored back to the image of God and the likeness of God. So the likeness of God is the character of God. And that's the work of the Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, temperance. Come on, somebody. Faithfulness. All these different things. That's the character. Okay, I better, I, better, I, better, I better close here. So Elijah says, this is where it comes from. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Clean hands, pure heart. So he developed this and he comes out and now he begins to start declaring and decreeing. And the word of the Lord, we see his obedience right away. The Lord told him, go tell Ahab this. He did it. And then all of a sudden after he finishes that, the Lord says, good. Now look, God will always reward obedience write it down because i'm closing now i've got three minutes left two minutes i said god always rewards obedience look at verse two after he obeyed god and told ahab verse two and first king 17 verse two and the word of the lord came to him again saying verse three go from here turn east and hide yourself by the brook Kireth, east of Jordan. You shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Well, you know what, Lord? Ravens are dirty birds. According to the law, you're not supposed to touch anything they touch. They're unclean. And you're going to feed me with food they bring to me? Hello? Isn't that contrary to your word? How many know God knows what he's doing? I want you to notice he obeyed and told the king what to do. And God says, now you know what? Because you obeyed me, I'm going to preserve you during this famine. Others won't have water, but I'm going to give you water. You're going to be able to have water to drink. And you know what else? There's going to be scarcity of food, but I'm going to make sure you have you have your 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 uh, 
your your McDonald's baby meal every every day is gonna be delivered. Uh huh. I'm gonna make sure Grubhub delivers, and you're gonna have you're gonna have it. Come on, Dash, DoorDash is coming every day. And now what does it say in verse five? So he did according to the word of the Lord. See, obedience brings blessing. Disobedience, pamalo. He did according to the word of the Lord. He went and he dwelt by the brook Chirat. Kirat, uh, Kirat, and east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him flesh, bread and flesh to eat in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank from the brook. After a while, the brook dried up. Mm -hmm. You know, God will only bring you so far, and then it's time for you, because you can get complacent. How are you hearing me? Come on, somebody. And he'll say, you know what? You've been, you've, been, you've been hanging around here too long and getting complacent. It's time to stir you up a little bit. Because there was no more rain in the land, there was no more water. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, arise, go to Zarephath. Right? Now underline Zarephath or write it down because we're going to learn about this next week. And go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Now, when we were reading about Ahab's, he married the daughter of a king. In, who was from the land of the Sidonians. Where? In Sidon. Sidonians. Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. For behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. What? You're going to send me to a heathen? land you're going to send me to the land of witchcraft you're going to send me to Zarephath to Sidon to the land of the Sidonians uh, didn't a guy by the name of Balaam come from there somewhere who tried to curse your people? Mm. We're going to learn about this next week and why it's important for you to understand. As, uh, no, I'm sorry, two weeks from now. Next week, Prophet Marty's coming. Hallelujah. So you get ready for that. And after that, two weeks from now, we'll come back and talk about Zarephat, amen, and we'll look forward to it. Father, we bless you tonight. We thank you for those that have joined us, those that will join us later on, whether it's YouTube or any other medium that, you, that will be, this message will be available on. We bless you tonight. We thank you for teaching us and helping us to understand just how powerful the imagination is and what you want us to do with it. We bless you. We praise you and we thank you as we bless every home, every hearer, and those that have requested Lord, prayer on the 300 prayer group or, or here on our Chicago group or whether it be on any other of our sites here at uh, Day Spring Commission, we just thank you for miracle signs and wonders. Thank you, Leo. Hallelujah rang the bell and hallelujah. The peal has gone out from that bell to tell the devil it's over. And we just thank you, Father God. You're going to do something for Pastor Paul. And we praise you and thank you, Father God, for the good things that are coming and transpiring. Even, Father God, for what you're doing, Father, in other people's lives as well. We love you, Lord. We bless you. And we thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.